of the lonely jobs, being a lookout man. In many ways, it's not unlike being a lighthouse keeper. The isolation, the responsibility, and the feeling of being close to nature and its elemental forces, fire and water. British Columbia's vast timberlands, the major resource of the province, employ many men, but essential to their protection and preservation is the work of the lookout man. Intimately acquainted with his own area, it's his job to spot fires when they're small, get in touch with the other members of the team so that the suppression crew can get onto the job quickly and put out that fire. Like the lookout man, the suppression crew is hired by the BC Forest Service and, as their name indicates, it's their job to attack those small fires before they become big, before it's necessary to call the working logger off the job with a consequent waste of man hours as well as valuable timber. But the one who initiates the action who puts the whole organization into high gear is the man on the mountaintop, the lookout man. In the whole province, we have about 150 permanent lookouts. And when the hazard is high, temporary lookouts are set up. All of them are chosen only after much planning and deliberation. Experience has shown that the maximum distance for good observation is about 10 miles. But it's obviously impossible to blanket the vast area of BC with such a concentration of lookouts. The ones we have are in areas of valuable timber, of a high degree of hazard to fire, or for some other reason, vulnerable to fire. In some places, the views interlock, extremely important in locating a fire. When reports are received from two or more lookouts, the ranger can accurately locate the trouble spot by the intersection of bearings as reported by the lookout men. Communication is of prime importance. When conditions permit, the telephone is probably most convenient. Otherwise, shortwave radio is used, or a combination of both. In the ranger station, a trained staff is always on hand, always on the job to receive reports from the lookout men in their district. They have other duties, of course, but when a fire is reported, other business must wait. We begin to see that the lookout man is a rather special person. He must be alert, observant. He should know the country under his care, for he can often direct firefighters to the trouble area and so save valuable time. When a fire has taken hold, blowing up as we say in the business, everyone in the country is reporting it. That's too late. The training of a new man is thorough. The first thing he must do is become familiar with the country. Every ridge, every pond, every landmark, big and small, they must become as familiar to him as your backyard is to you. He must have proper equipment and know how to use it. Most of it is specialized. The fire finder, photographs, records, log, radio, binoculars, and colored glasses. His general health must be good, and his eyesight must be excellent. It's quite possible that our new lookout man has hunted or fished in this country for years. He may know it intimately and would never become lost. But that's not enough. He must know all the physical features by name so that his reports can be understood. He must know their exact location 
in relation to his lookout. He must know distances, bearings, elevations. The ranger, or the assistant ranger, can save the new man time by pointing out the various important landmarks and their relation one to the other. With this expert help, the lookout man can correlate the actual landscape with maps and with photographs. As he notes each salient point, the lookout man makes notes and then writes up his notes into a log, which can be used for quick reference and so save time in an emergency. Details such as distance, location of access road, location of streams or other sources of water, clearings, mill sites, all these are located and marked in the log. The photos in the Forest Service lookout are far removed from ordinary snapshots. They're taken with a special surveying camera and are a faithful reproduction of the landscape as seen from the lookout. They're covered with a grid of fine lines which correspond to the readings of the firefinder. Suppose a lookout man sees a smoke. On the appropriate photograph, he can locate the exact spot and the bearing can be found from the superimposed grid. In addition to astronomical bearings, the photos also give the number of degrees above or below the horizon line. Because of the height of the lookout, usually he'll sight downhill to a fire and can read the degrees of downslope on his fire finder, which can be checked with the photo grid. With the position of the fire fixed, he can then report to the ranger by phone or radio. An exact duplicate set of photos is kept at the ranger's station, and the ranger from them can immediately locate the blades. Communication, the link in the chain between lookout and ranger station, is vital. Without it, the lookout is to all intents and purposes non-existent. The lookout man must know his equipment, how to use it, and how to adjust it. He must know correct Department of Transport regulations and procedures. He must know that he cannot transmit a radio signal without identifying the call of his transmitter. All right, our man is trained. How does he operate? He sees smoke. Fine, but it's not good enough to tell the ranger that it's over that way. He must be accurate. The firefinder is an accurate instrument designed just for this job. He sights the smoke through the finder, lines it up with the crosshairs, and reads the astronomical bearing. Next, he checks with the lookout photograph of the area, plots the position. Then to the map, where he measures off the distance. Now he has his facts, bearing, distance, exact location. XLZ-86, Lake Carchin, this is XMQ-49, log lookout. XLZ-86 back, go ahead. I have a smoke for you, bearing 270 degrees, uh, 30 minutes, uh, vertical angle uh, minus 2 degrees, uh, distance 6 miles, on the Henderson property. Over. Bearing 270 degrees, 30 minutes, vertical angle minus 2 degrees, distance 6 miles. Confirm and over. Roger, roger. It's beginning to send up black smoke. Uh, not moving yet, but it looks as though it might. Topography is steep. Uh, an old logging, over. How big is it, over? Uh, only a spot, over. We have checked with a report from Bald Lookout and confirmed that your fire is on the Henderson property. Sandy is on his way. Keep an eye on it, over. XMQ49 standing by. 
XLZ86 clear with XMQ49 and calling XMO88. Over. Keen power of observation is the key to being a successful lookout man. He must have other qualities, of course, but unless he can observe skillfully and efficiently, he's of little use. He learns to use his binoculars. He knows that his colored glasses are an aid to cutting haze. He learns that visibility depends on many things, on haze, industrial smoke, smoke from nearby towns, and at times, even smoke from forest fires. Under these conditions, he's constantly watchful, on the alert for any momentary clearing of smoke or haze. He must know the difference between smoke and those little puffs of cloud that hang around the mountains. He must know the dust, light-colored rock bluffs, and the silvery gray color of old burnt areas are not smoke. In other words, he must be careful not to send in a false alarm, but equally careful not to miss a genuine fire. In essence, then, our lookout man is on the alert for any change in his landscape, since this is what will catch the eye, but only the trained eye. Most people can see, but very few really observe. Getting supplies to this lookout presents no problem, but in many cases there's no convenient road to the mountaintop, and the lookout man often must pack his supplies up a mountain trail. And don't forget that supplies usually include water, which weighs 62 and a half pounds per cubic foot. With limited space, neatness and order are essential. And with picture windows on all sides, there's no room for walk-in cupboards. The Forest Service supplies bedding and cooking utensils, a complete miniature furnished house, if you like. Unlike the average weekend woodsman, most lookout men are not entirely dependent on the frying pan, and some of them become very good cooks, even though they sometimes burn their fingers. Summer thunderstorms can be a bit of a menace, particularly if your house happens to be the highest point on the highest mountain and the lightning's crackling all around you. But all lookouts have a lightning arrestor system, properly grounded, so that when lightning does strike, no damage is done. Furthermore, the lightning arrestor system means that the safest place for the lookout man during an electrical storm is right inside the lookout. Of course, he must use common sense and keep away from metal objects, such as the stove, and he must not use his phone or radio while the storm is overhead. The fact that the lookout man must make regular reports on a definite schedule also is a safety feature, for any failure to report will bring immediate help. If for any reason he must leave the lookout for a period of time, he reports accordingly. And just because a man lives alone, it doesn't mean that he hates people. And visits from hikers give you a chance to 
see if your tea is still palatable to the rest of humanity. And a chance to show at least some of the world just what it is you do, apart from just sitting on your mountain.